Calispera Sass. It's a great honor for me to be here today in this great historic city and this marvelous venue. I'm extremely grateful to our hosts for giving me this opportunity and for all their kind and generous words that they've given today and for all of your wonderful hospitality. And I'm also very pleased to be able to catch up with some old friends uh, here in Athens. I'm most honored also to have been invited to present the first annual lecture of the Society, as well as to be a corresponding member of the Society. And I'm looking forward very much to supporting all of your activities and to finding out more about all of your very important work here in Greece, which I know is very strong and engages with the broad historiographical trends of our international field. So I feel very privileged to be here. I know that we've got another event to look forward to in Greece this weekend, which will be on all of your minds, I'm sure. And I'm glad that we too have the chance here today to take the long view, as well as to look forward towards the future. Although you'll be relieved to know that I won't be asking you to vote at the end. My theme today is new directions in the history of education. I'm wanting us to look forward to the future of our great field and to analyze fresh trends. How far can we point towards new directions at a vibrant research agenda emerging today, which engages in a critical way with historical perspectives and insights, methods and theories? And how relevant is all this to Greece? and to the future of education here in this part of the world. Of course, I don't need to remind this audience that to look forward, we must first of all understand where we've come from. And that to understand change, we must also recognize continuity. I've tried to look both forwards and backwards not a very easy position to take up, in my new book, The Struggle for the History of Education. That's this book here. And here it is there. One reviewer has described this book as part historiography, part curriculum vitae. And I suppose that our lives and our experiences do stimulate our ideas and our questions about history to a large extent. And our lives are spent in education and in the history of education. So I'm quite happy with that kind of view. Initially then, may I outline some important ways in which our history has shaped what we are today as a field and as researchers and teachers in this field and the dimensions of this history which provide both the sources of our strengths and the sources of our characteristic weaknesses. I will describe this history in terms of a struggle, a contest, about the fundamental nature and purpose of the field. One which is still unresolved and is at the heart of dilemmas about our future relationship and development. I know that in classical Greek culture, you speak of this as an aron, a competition through which you try to improve yourselves. And I think that's very apt for us to think of it in those terms. This struggle is closely connected to our intellectual location as a field of study, 
which is on the borders of education, history, and the social sciences. And these three great areas, these great domains, offer us rich hinterlands to support our work, but they can also be very vulnerable to attack. I'm wanting to draw on some of our traditions as an international field to propose what I would see as an integrated vision that engages with all of these constituencies or tributaries of our work. This leads us on to consider some of the promising new approaches to informing our research and replenishing our field. In one respect, I think this is about developing our connections with different theories and methods, and perhaps more fundamentally, about bolstering ideas about theory itself and on the principles of methodology. It also involves seeking new directions for our work, often in familiar areas, but looking at these in fresh ways. And it's this search for novelty, for freshness, for boldness in looking forward that's the key issue in my talk today. And I think in general that I have a positive story to tell, which I hope is what we need in these bleak times of troubles and difficulties. The history of education is often seen, at least by newcomers to our field, as perhaps an uncontroversial and maybe an undemanding type of study, far removed from the great debates of our time, maybe even of rather marginal concern. It could be seen as providing a reasonably stable body of knowledge which grows steadily and organically over time, which is always with us as a familiar and perhaps a comfortable presence, the, the Acropolis view of history, perhaps. Yet beneath its placid surface, it can be recognized as a site of struggle. I would characterize it as an exciting and intellectually challenging field of study that's highly relevant to an understanding of broader issues in history, education, and society as a whole. It's also the other side of that, the other side of this struggle. It's also prone to often fierce debates about identity and its future direction as a field. Indeed, debates about what it's for and about its basic rationale and contribution have gone on unabated for at least the past century. It is beset with underlying uncertainties and insecurities. These issues about contestation, identity, rationale, strategy, are played out in different ways in different countries. The problems and the opportunities that face the field can look very different if you're in England or in the United States or in New Zealand or in Greece. They're closely related in each case to broader educational, social and political issues that affect each country differently. We need to acknowledge that. And yet, they have common roots. They have a shared intellectual heritage, which we all inherit. For many years, as is well known, the dominant rationale of the history of education was to support the further development of the national systems of schooling that arisen around the world in the 19th and the early 20th centuries. The main tendencies of this approach were to celebrate the spread and the growth of education. 
to proselytize on behalf of the teaching profession, to underpin further advances in the form of gradual, progressive reform, presenting these as symptoms and stimulants of gradual social and economic improvement. It was this that was often described as the liberal progressive model of the history of education, an uncritical exercise by and large in nostalgia and myth-making, written mainly by educationists for the benefit of teacher trainees. The historical value of such work was often somewhat limited and it placed little store by social methods, social science methods and perspectives. But it fostered a convenient and a usable version of the past. That teachers, educators and policymakers could use to support their own endeavors. In other words, it tended to be highly instrumentalist in nature, fashioning a usable past in the interests of contemporary institutions and policies. By the 1960s, the liberal progressive model was wearing thin, it was being decisively undermined, in many countries at least, partly because it was so unhistorical, but also because increasingly its optimistic narrative simply didn't ring true alongside the deep-seated dilemmas of Western schooling. In the United States, scholars such as Bernard Balin and Lawrence Kremin led the way in questioning the general thrust in writing in the history of education. And their basic critique was echoed and developed further in other Western countries over the following decades. In the place of that educational rationale, therefore, there rose an alternative rival rationale that emphasized the historical claims of the field. According to this general formulation, the history of education should be viewed as an aspect of social history in such a way that it would be concerned principally with discovering the historical connections between education and other aspects of society. In Britain, this key objective was expressed most forcefully, perhaps, by the leading social historian, Asa Briggs, writing in the first issue of the journal History of Education in the early 1970s, when he argued that the study of the history of education was best considered as part of the wider study of the history of society. Social history broadly interpreted with the politics, the economics, and it's necessary to add, the religion put in. One implication of this approach, at least for some, was that the history of education should concentrate on its mission to illuminate the past for its own sake, rather than become contaminated, as they could see it, with concerns about the present. There were, of course, many historians who regarded themselves as both historians and educationists. Nevertheless, to the extent that history and education comp represented competing rationales, the rise of the historical standpoint was a major challenge to a rationale that depended principally on the value of the field to education. But there's also been a third basic approach, and this has emanated from the social sciences. Now, of course, there have long been significant contributions to the history of education by a wide range of social scientists. In Britain, for example, sociologists such as A.H. Halsey and Olive Banks have produced important historical work. And more broadly, the insights of social theorists such as Pierre Bourdieu have stimulated many new approaches. And yet, there have often been tensions that have developed as a result of this. Sociologists and historians have often tended to have an uneasy intellectual relationship. The former being concerned with developing theory and articulating methodological concerns in a way 
that historians have often found strange and even difficult. The cultural historian Peter Burke has characterized the mutual relationship of historians and sociologists as a dialogue of the deaf, in which each group tends to perceive the other in terms of a rather crude stereotype. And these tensions have been mirrored in and around the history of education. There has also been an emergent tension over the past two decades between broadly social scientific and interdisciplinary rationales and other established justifications for the history of education. So, some historians of education have tended to assert the historical contribution of the field, others its educational importance, and still others its implications for the social sciences more broadly. All of this has generated important and interesting research. And yet, I would want to take this opportunity to remind us of the grand, more inclusive tradition across these key constituencies to address the concerns that lie across all three of these great domains. And in doing so, I draw very consciously from the examples of two great figures from our past. The first is Emil Durkheim, and the second is Brian Simon. Both Durkheim and Simon, in their different ways, emphasize the importance of cultivating the history of education within a broad framework involving education, history, and the social sciences. Over a century ago, Emil Durkheim, the French sociologist and professor of pedagogy at the Sorbonne in Paris, expressed an expansive vision for the history of education in his lectures on the formation and development of secondary education in France. Uh, here is his book, uh, which has been translated into English with great influence on myself, The Evolution of Educational Thought. His rationale for the study of the history of education embraced education, history, and the social sciences. Durkheim argued eloquently that it's only by carefully studying the past that we can come to anticipate the future and to understand the present, so that the history of education provides the soundest basis, in his view, for the study of educational theory. History, he said, could also help us to understand the organization of education and to illuminate the educational ideals which the organization was designed to achieve. While in broader terms, it helped us to understand humanity itself and the aspirations of individuals and groups. The present was itself merely, he said, wonderfully, an extrapolation from the past from which it cannot be severed without losing the greater part of its significance. What a wonderful phrase. And thus, he insisted, only history can penetrate under the surface of the present educational system. Only history can analyze it. Only history can show us of what elements it's formed, on what conditions each of them depends, how they are interrelated. Only history, in a word, can bring us to the long chain of causes and effects of which it is the result. And it was for these reasons, according to Durkheim, that we should carry out historical research into the manner in which educational configurations have progressively come to cluster together, to combine and form organic relationships. And at the same time, Durkheim linked these concerns systematically with his broader sociological interests. He argued that historical and social studies were close relatives that were destined eventually, he said, to merge with each other and that education was bound up with both. For example, he defined education as the methodological socialization of the new generation through which society would renew itself under the supervision of the state. Moreover, 
An understanding of psychology, he said, was also necessary in order to comprehend the diversity of human intelligence and character. For his part, Brian Simon, the leading historian of education produced in Britain since the Second World War, insisted that the study of the history of education should be designed to illuminate the nature of education as a social function, which would be of primary importance in every society. Here's one of his best books, I think, Does Education Matter? His best book of essays, uh, every essay a gem, um, really, really interesting from the, from the first essay, simply called Does Education Matter? Can Education Change Society? And it's, it's a, a beautiful set of essays. And also worth reading, it, Brian Simon's um, autobiography, his memoirs, A Life in Education. And you see here him as a young man and as the distinguished historian of education that he was to become later on. According to Simon, it should be one of the main tasks of historical study to trace the development of education in this sense, to try to assess the function it has fulfilled at different stages of social development and so to reach a deeper understanding of the function it fulfills today. Simon's work also emphasised the differences of social class interests. As he said, modern education systems, it seems to me, are an area where the interests and objectives of different social classes, strata, and even groups meet and very often clash. This approach to the history of education had clear implications for an understanding of contemporary policies and problems. It should, he insisted, bring educational developments into perspective and in so doing, open the teacher's eyes to the real nature of their work. It should enable the student to understand that educational ideas and institutions contained historical components, some of which might no longer be relevant or viable, and should be open to reconsideration. And he concluded famously, there is perhaps no more liberating influence than the knowledge that things have not always been as they are and need not remain so. How relevant, then, are these ideas and the practical examples of Durkheim and Simon to new directions in the history of education today? It seems to me that over the last 20 years, there have been significant challenges to the history of education in many countries, threatening, in many cases, its strategic position as a field and its potential for the future. Despite the growth in the active role of the state in education and the long period of educational reform and reconstruction that's been widespread over that time, historians of education have often found it difficult in practice to make a substantial contribution to inform these changes. Changes in teacher education and the nature of educational research have led to major strategic difficulties in many countries. And yet, at the same time, there have been important advances intellectually in and around the field, pointing the way towards new developments in theory and methodology. And in some key areas of our work, I believe these are now bearing fruit in significant new work. Little more than 10 years ago, the leading American historian of education, Jürgen Herbst, complained that there was little fresh input in the field so that we're left, in his words, endlessly repeating old mantras. And there are, at the same time, competing pressures towards specialization and fragmentation. Yet it seems to me, contrary to these concerns, which I respect, that our field is now learning slowly and sometimes painfully to draw on the full range of our intellectual heritage. This is helping us to engage more fully, more openly, with theoretical and methodological approaches from across education, history, and the social sciences. It's also beginning to have a significant impact on substantive areas of our research. This is important for strategic reasons as well as epistemological ones. 
as we seek ways of defining and defending the position of history of education in the academy and in public discourse. But finding ways of sharing and highlighting our common concerns as history of historians of education is a key task ideologically, no less than pragmatically, in binding together individuals and groups whose work has sometimes come to appear disparate and even incoherent. This is especially urgent, I think, in hard times such as we have today, to try to comprehend the economic and social crisis in so many contemporary societies as part of a broad and interdisciplinary vision for the history of education as a whole. So, let's look first then at the developing relationship between the history of education and theory and methodology. One interesting feature here is an increasing willingness to address theoretical concerns in an open and explicit way. The history of education has often been uncomfortable with theory in general, unwilling or unable to engage with theoretical and philosophical issues, in common with many historians in general, I think it must be said. In the 1950s, the sociologist C. Wright Mills claimed that although history was highly theoretical in nature, inherently, many historians showed what he called a calm unawareness of this that he found impressive but unsettling. And Fritz Stern once commented that most historians are reluctant to articulate their views about theory. They might have views, but they like to keep them under wraps. And yet, as Peter Burke again has recognized, Partly in response to the challenge of postmodernism, many historians have overcome their professional reticence and have reflected more broadly on the general relationship between history and theory. According to Burke, this has led to some convergence between historians on the one side and theorists on the other, in an age, as he says, of blurred lines and open intellectual frontiers, an age at once exciting and confusing. In the history of education, there has been much more activity in addressing theoretical debates over the last 20 years, it seems to me. This has been reflected in special issues of history of education journals to address theoretical issues front on. An emerging interest in the implications of diverse insights from Quentin Skinner, Walter Benjamin, Edward Said, Liz Stanley, and many others. The challenge posed by postmodernism has been especially strong, I think, in the history of education, where an empiricist tradition based on acts and facts has been entrenched and difficult to dislodge. And yet here too there is potential movement in current debates around the nature of historical truth, drawing on the potential for a social realist approach to knowledge as Michael Young's recent work proposes. An epistemological debate formed in the social sciences about the social relationships of knowledge has important implications for the history of education. In response to methodology, similarly, the history of education tended not to be conscious of methodological issues which have been familiar elsewhere while it generally privileged a top-down narrative of policy changes that were based on reports and government committees. This, in turn, had the effect of excluding voices and the views of many, such as girls and women, working-class youth, ethnic minorities, immigrant groups, and indigenous peoples in many countries around the world. New sources and methods have been found partly through enlisting a broader range of documentary evidence, as well as by asking different questions of it. Personal documents, such as letters, diaries, and autobiographies, have been examined more frequently, and it has to be said, more systematically. Novels are one source that have been somewhat underused in the history of education, and yet they provide a key means of conveying the subjective experiences of schooling. One type of novel that I, I think in particular is especially important in this regard as a kind of source, just as an illustration, 
are the realist novels of the mid-19th century. For example, William Makepeace Thackeray, with his Vanity Fair in 1848. Charles Dickens, with David Copperfield. George Eliot, uh, an almost forgotten source in this area, but Adam Bede is a fantastic source yeah, on education. As also with Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary in France. Charles Levine has noted that realism tended to be the dominant narrative mode of a Victorian England in which perhaps the greatest of all virtues, greater than sexual propriety, was truth-telling. Observing things as they are, with quasi-scientific detachment, he said, displaces false representations with authentic ones and forces readers out of delusions that lead to moral disaster. And there are many more recent works of fiction that provide interesting historical evidence. From Goodbye, Mr. Chips in the 1930s, both as a novel and a film, to the plays of Alan Bennett in our own time. Meanwhile, institutional source materials such as textbooks, school magazines, school books and logbooks have been used more widely. Biographical methods have investigated the relationships between the personal and private on the one hand and the social and political on the other, or what Wright Mills called the sociological imagination. Oral history has become a common feature of the field over the last 20 years, and this has been followed more recently by a vogue in visual history. These methodological devices have permitted more detailed attention to be given to the social experiences of education, including in the classroom, which until 20 years ago, I think we may agree, tended to be no-go areas for the historian of education. A promising new theme, which should take this trend still further, is that of sensory history, which is only now beginning to be recognized for its potential contribution to the history of education. Sensory history involves highlighting the five senses of smell, sound, touch, taste, and sight in historical research. Emily Cockaine's historical research on urban environments in England in the 17th and 18th centuries has helped to take forward our understanding of what she describes as the hubbub of filth, noise, and stench, a diverse range of physical and emotional reactions to unpleasant things such as poor quality food, smoke, dirt, dust, stench, and putrefaction. Sensory history and the history of the emotions have thus far not been used to any great extent in the history of education, but there are signs that this situation is beginning to change. For example, Burke and Grosvenor have recently investigated what they call the hearing school, in terms of an exploration of sound and listening in the modern school, the soundscape of the school in the 20th century. And we recall, if we, if we think about it, that very little history of education actually tells you about the noises of history of education, what education sounded like. It's as if it took place in a soundproof booth. And this is now changing. Mark M. Smith has suggested that there is scope for a new deal of new historical research on the sensory worlds of children and how they've understood the senses in the process of learning the social protocols and cultural expectations of their society. Peter Hoffer points out that this process is applied historically to adults as well as to children as they enter the sensate environment to conform to learned priorities of sensation. For example, according to Hoffer, the receptivity of the senses or the ability to describe what we have sensed can be expanded with experience, so establishing what he calls a sensuous etiquette in which the senses tell us where we belong in society and how we should behave in different circumstances and contexts. As Smith points out too, it was smell, perhaps more than any other sense, that served to create and mark out social territory, to identify the other, to justify various forms of control and subjugation, and to serve as a barrier against meaningful integration into host or dominant societies. 
Smith's own research on race and slavery in the American South in the 19th century vividly highlights the importance of sensory stereotypes. He points out also that children's books, often published in the North, but also read widely in the South, dealt with the senses in some detail and taught children the physiological and cultural functioning of the senses, which in turn could help to justify a given social order. In addition, Smith relates this sensory dimension to the resilience of school segregation until the Brown decision in the United States in the 1950s, and concludes strikingly that henceforward, not only would whites now have to see blacks, they would also have to hear, smell, taste, and touch them, no longer on their own terms, but on terms set by federal authority and exacted daily by black people. Such theoretical and methodological developments have in turn encouraged new approaches in key areas of the history of education, often in familiar terrain, but now being addressed in different ways. One such has been the theme of social disadvantage and exclusion. Earlier work had emphasized social class conflict and the role of the organized working class, such as Simon in Britain and Katz in the United States. More recent work has reflected a wider range of concerns relating to social disadvantage and exclusion, including gender, ethnicity, disability, sexuality, and greater awareness of what's often called the intersectionality of all of these. In relation to social class, some attention has shifted to the nature of the middle classes, engaging with recent research by historians and sociologists. Some of my own recent work has investigated the middle class traditions of secondary education in England in terms of insecurity of status, fear of failure, and anxiety regarding social decline, familiar neuroses of the bourgeoisie. Historical discussion of working class education has itself moved from a preoccupation with the political and industrial dimensions to an emerging concern with cultural identity. For example, in Jonathan Rose's excellent work, The Intellectual Life of the British Working Classes. Histories of teaching have likewise shown a tendency to develop from a prevailing concern with professionalization in the 1960s and unionism in the 1980s to a new interest in the nature of teachers' professionalism, that is, their daily experience of teaching. The work of Kate Rosmanier in the United States and of Peter Cunningham and Phil Gardner in England are excellent examples of this recent trend, which has been greatly stimulated by oral history. At the same time, there's been new awareness of the importance of learners and learning in the history of education. The history of literacy and reading has increasingly sought to illuminate the nature of readers and audiences and their interactions with texts. As Rose observes, 20 years ago, the historiography of reading scarcely existed. Many historians at that time doubted that we could ever recover anything so private, so evanescent as the inner experiences of ordinary readers in the past. Where were such experiences recorded? What sources could we possibly use? And more broadly, a social history of learners and learning can draw selectively from education, history, and the social sciences in different ways. First, it can seek to engage theoretically with the concept of learning as a social process, more fully, more systematically than has been attempted in previous historical work. Learning, of course, is not simply about reading, nor is it gauged simply through an understanding of social purposes and institutions, and neither is it merely intellectual in nature. It's a social process, and it embodies a wide range of experiences through which the learner comes to identify himself or herself and the world around them. Second, this process is examined from the point of view of the learner and the learners themselves, rather than from those of the policymakers and the teachers, as has tended to be habitual in the past. And thirdly, an attempt is made to relate this history to current educational problems and policies, 
and to broader research trends in education and the social sciences. The general aim of such work, I think, is to begin to shed light on the social nature and importance of learning since modern ideas about learning started to, do, to be developed in the Enlightenment of the 18th century. And again, in terms of international and transnational agendas, there's been evidence of a pursuit of new directions, it seems to me. Much research on education dwells on its aspects as part of domestic social policy, while there's also a smaller body of work that highlights its significance as part of foreign and overseas policy, especially in the export of ideas and practices to other countries. And yet, there's a further dimension to this that's attracted attention only quite recently, which is the relationship between the country's changing place in the world and the nature of education and society at home. This also relates more broadly still to an awareness of the interdependence of nations and the international and global nature of many challenges in the modern world. So it is that globalization has finally become an emerging theme in the history of education, while authors such as Richard Aldridge have begun to develop historical perspectives on education and environmental challenges to human survival. In this context, increasing attention has been given to the history of the British Empire and the nature of its contribution and legacy in the modern world. Much of this general literature, such as a five-volume Oxford history of the British Empire, has included little material specifically on education. At the same time, a substantial literature has developed on the ways in which the ideas and practices of education in Britain has influenced the character of education in different parts of the British Empire. This literature has generated very interesting debates around the nature of cultural imperialism, the relationship between the centre and the periphery, the extent to which imperial influences were beneficial, and the ways in which these influences were played out in different nations and areas. And latterly, too, there's been increasing interest in the kinds of resistance that developed on the part of colonised and indigenous groups. And yet, the educational relationships between Britain, for example, and her empire, and between the, the metropolis and empires around the world, didn't run only in one direction. As Burke, again, has pointed out, there are evident dangers in a simple model of centre and periphery, in which knowledge is diffused from Europe to other parts of the world, in particular for the tendency of such an approach to take insufficient knowledge, insufficient account of flows of knowledge from periphery to centre, as well as in the opposite direction. So, over the past decade, there's developed the beginnings of a new historical interest in the reverse process, that is, how ideas and practices of education in different parts of empires can exert influence in the imperial homeland itself. This new literature, stimulated in part by Edward Said's culture and imperialism, has potential for a great deal of further development to investigate the dynamics of edu education in the metropolis, which would be only rarely stable and often unpredictable in their nature and effects. Said's work considered the overlapping territories, the intertwined histories of imperial culture, examining how a post-imperial intellectual attitude might expand the overlapping community between metropolitan and formerly colonized societies. He went on to investigate how images of empire have permeated Western culture, for example, in major works of fiction. Cultural texts, as he says, imported the foreign into Europe in ways that very clearly mark the, bear the mark of the imperial enterprise, of explorers and ethnographers, of geologists and geographers, of merchants and soldiers. And this key insight has underpinned a new historical literature that focuses on the influence of empire on the imperial homeland itself. So far as the implications for and of education are concerned, some interesting and important earlier work was also produced. For example, by Castle and Ethorne on national identity, 
and the elementary school curriculum. And this has now been taken much further by Catherine Hall, whose work has developed key connections between metropolitan culture and the imperial world. Hall and Rose have helped to explore a range of ways in which Britain's status as an imperial power, for example, became a part of the lived lives of Britons. Hall has also pursued the issue of how the formal process of education has helped to construct the colonial visions and expectations of the colonizers at home. The powerful theme of empires at home has also been discussed in detail in a recent collection of work at an international symposium, um, which has been linked through Britain and Germany and the organization of Isha. For example, in this collection, Ruth Watts investigates imperial influences on British education in the 19th century, drawing on post-colonial theory and broader historical literature, as well as comparisons with other imperial countries. In conclusion then, let me reflect finally on a few themes that have loomed large in my thinking for today. First, if I can, the theme of change. Our field has changed greatly over the past century. It was once the home of rather dry, smug texts that charted the rise of national systems of schooling. It's now, I think, much more diverse, much more outward looking, intellectually reinvigorated by continual contact with educational, historical, and social scientific debates. It must continue to change, to look forward towards the future. But in order to do so in a principled and coherent way, it must do so by understanding its own past and the continuities and changes that have brought us to where we are today. Second, the theme of ideals. The history of education explores the aspirations of individuals and families, of schools and universities, to improve themselves, to build towards a better future. These hopes and dreams involve ideals as well as interests, social ideals that are testimony to the redeeming qualities of humanity. Let us, as a field, while exploring the contradictions of education, find it in ourselves to draw upon its ideals also, to teach ourselves to build upon our finest traditions and our best minds. Third, the theme of partnerships. The history of education has drawn eclectically on a wide range of intellectual bases, which I've characterized very crudely as, as education, history, and the social sciences, and increasingly with an international and a global canvas. Let's resolve to regard this as a partnership with complementary interests, rather than as a dysfunctional matching of unequals. And fourth, the theme of the future, to which I add a question mark. As Carly Simon sang, we can never know about the days to come, but we think about them anyway. Can we take forward the large intellectual project that faces historians of education today in different parts of the world? If we can do so, I believe that we can help to realize in the 21st century the grand strategic vision of the history of education, taking forward a continual struggle for the history of education, contributing towards the rise of new approaches to study that contribute to education, history, and society alike, in the spirit of Durkheim and Simon, to an engagement on equal terms that can be central rather than marginal to a wide range of scholars and analyses that tell us more about our wider world and about ourselves. Sas F. Callisto. Thank you very much.